And joining us now, Howard Hampton, the leader of the Ontario New Democrats and the MPP for Kenora Rainy River. Good to have you back here at TVO. Nice to be here. I want to start by just looking back a little bit. You announced back in June that you were stepping down as Ontario NDP leader. There was no great clamoring to kick you out, which is the circumstance under which most <laughs> leaders leave. Yeah. So why did you decide to leave? It's time to go. The, um, the reality for me is I've led the party through three elections, three tough elections. And you have to ask yourself, after every election, do I have the energy and the desire and the drive to do this for four more years? And the time to ask yourself that is after the election, because you, it's not just running in the next election campaign. It's everything you have to do in the next four years. And I, I couldn't answer that question in the affirmative. Just couldn't do it. But most people who come to the conclusion that they don't want to lead the party anymore <clears throat> say, and therefore I'm getting out of politics. You're not doing that, right? You've said you're going to run again. Yeah. So how does that make sense? Um, I also want to do the right thing for the party. And I think the right thing for the party is, is for me to run again in Kenora Rainy River. We've uh, we started to build a pretty good base there. In fact, we started to build a pretty good base across northern Ontario. So I, th I think the best thing for me to do is is to do that one more time. I, I've always liked the constituency work. I've always enjoyed that. And that's quite separate from uh, running in another election. When you decided to step down, this is what Murray Campbell wrote in the Globe and Mail. He said, Mr. Hampton had the thankless task of leading the NDP after voters laid a beating on Bob Ray's government in 1995. When he took over the party a year later, it enjoyed, if that's the word, a 7% standing in some polls. Nobody Unions, Bay Street, and the ordinary voters who had endured Mr. Ray's high tax, high deficit years of government was willing to listen to anything the NDP had to say. The fact that the NDP is still alive today with a mid-teens poll number is a testament to Mr. Hampton's perseverance. Everybody knew what the lay of the land was back in 95 after yes, we did. you went from government to 17 seats. So why did you want the job in the first place? Uh, look, I'm a new Democrat, right? I, I, I'm not here because... Uh, you know, I, I saw myself as a uh, premier or something. I'm a new Democrat. I'm a social Democrat. I believe very strongly that you can't base an economy and a society on greed. And that's, that's very much what the you know, modern capitalism is all about. Uh, and I acted on my, my beliefs. Uh, and the second part is we had so many members elected uh, from Northern Ontario that it would have been bizarre I, for no candidate to come forward from Northern Ontario. It would have looked very strange. Half your, half your caucus is from Northern Ontario and you can't find one person who's interested in running. Um, so those two things uh, really required that one of us run and when Bud Wildman wouldn't do it, and most of us wanted Bud to do it, uh, it fell to me to do it. And what was the biggest challenge of leading the party in the post-Ray years? Well, it, trying to you know, put some of the things that happened uh, under Bob Ray between 1990 and 1995 behind us. And we've started to do that. And, and I, if I may, it's, it's probably helped that Bob Ray has now openly said he's a liberal. And many people in the party always felt that Bob Ray uh, really wanted to fold the NDP into, into the Liberal Party. That was, his big, that was his big project in politics. And now he's, he's rather open about it. So that's actually helped us, I think, start to rebuild. You've been very critical of him since he went over to the Liberals. Did, did you always have a bad relationship with him? I wouldn't say it was a bad relationship. No, I mean, as I said, I'm a new Democrat. Did you know at the time he wasn't? Or oh, did you think oh, no, at the time no, no, he wasn't? No, no. I, I, think, uh, I think when I really realized it was in the fall of 1996, when Mr. Ray called just about everybody who was part of the caucus, into his office and openly talked about a cooperation agreement with the Liberals. And I, I remember walking out of the, his office and when it's so open, you, you sort of, you think retroactively or retrospectively to other events that have happened, say, in the last two or three years, and all the pieces fit together and you have that eureka moment and you go, oh, okay, I see. <laughs> and I, I think for a lot of people, uh, they retrospectively you know, put the pieces together and said, oh, this has been his big project, and go all the way back to 1985. Let us go back. Let's go back to the last four elections and take a look at what's happened in the NDP's percentage of the total votes cast. Mm -hmm. Michael, if we can, this graphic. 1995, 
That's the election you mm -hmm. lost, obviously, where you lost the government. 20.6% of the total votes cast. Yep. 99, it was at 12.6. That's your first election. Sure. 03, 14.7, up yep. a little. 07, 16.8. Mm -hmm. Now, you have managed to nudge that vote up a bit, election after election after election. But it's a, you know, I think you'd acknowledge it's a far cry from the days when the NDP was traditionally getting, you know, 25% of the total votes cast. Mm -hmm. Why do you think there is still that almost 10% gap between what you traditionally got and what you now enjoy? Well, I think you add on to, have to add on to that. Um, the results in the recent federal election. Because we came awfully close to winning a lot more seats a year ago in the provincial election. And we won them in the federal election. And we increased our vote yet again. Look, um, I, I think what happened between 1990 and 1995 is a lot of people who had identified with the NDP didn't identify with New Democrats anymore. Uh, I mean, they just became uh, disillusioned, disoriented, uh, completely disinterested. I mean, just this is not my party anymore. And it is not easy to win that back. But I, I think we have uh, turned a leaf now. And I think, given a combination of events and circumstances, uh, we'll continue to increase our support and offer people in Ontario a real alternative to uh, what I continue to see is you can either have blue or blue light. Conservatives will offer you blue, and the McGuinty Liberals increasingly look like blue light. Let me follow up on, on what you say is Bob Ray's big project now, which is the kind of a coming sure. together of sure. liberals and new Democrats. Yeah, I see you. I see you. <laughs> in fact, it's kind of happening right now at the federal yeah. level. Yeah. You say the option is blue or blue light. Why wouldn't you want to take blue light and put an orange tinge to it so that you don't have to be out of power again as long as you were? If there were only two parties in this province, you guys could be in like every other cycle, as it were and have a real impact in a way that you don't when you're perpetually in opposition. No, you do. We do have an impact. I know you do, but you'd have and, more and, if you were and, a cabinet minister. Not, not true. Not true. New Wait Dem a sec. You've been a cabinet minister. Yeah, you're telling true. me you have more impact as a leader of a third party than you do around a cabinet table? New Democrats have had much more impact. Okay, tell me how. Let's just roll it back to the uh, Harris Conservative years. I mean, the Conservatives had this project. They wanted to turn on, uh, let's take the hydro system. They, they basically wanted to say to Enron, come on into Ontario. And the Conservatives literally were sitting down with Enron and, and, and designing the future of hydroelectricity in this province according to Enron's wishes. Now, as we all know, Enron turned out to be a giant fraud in the United States uh, who uh, took people for millions of dollars, billions of dollars of losses, uh, treated their workers and employees miserably, uh, and uh, was responsible for some of the, you know, the greatest... Uh, sort of uh, electricity upheaval, uh, some economic upheaval that, uh, that some okay. United States had seen. But the conservative deregulation plan never happened, never got rolled out the Be way Mike Harris wanted because it Because the Democrats fought it. No, it's because Ernie Eves decided in the no. end it wasn't worth doing. No, because uh, in the end, we turned that into a political issue which became tremendously unpopular for the conservatives. Tremendously unpopular. So their, their first attempt at deregulation blew up in their face. By that time, we had made it such a political issue and put it, got it high enough on the political radar screen that Ernie Hughes looked at it and said, I'm not doing this. I'm going to back away from it. Now, you, know, you say to me, well, if, if, if you'd been a liberal, you could have done more. The liberals were prepared. Dalton McGinty and the liberals were prepared to go lockstep with the conservatives. In fact, were prepared to go even further. You think, it would be, it, you, think you can have more influence as the leader of a group of, say, 10 than you can as a cabinet minister? Yes. Because you know why? Because you raise the issues and you turn them into public issues and you give them public profile. Uh, we, we would have a completely privatized electricity system with even greater job loss and more and more people not being able to pay their hydro bill every month. Uh, because I can tell you, there was virtually no difference between the liberal position and the conservative position. So there is still an important place, you believe, on the political firmament for the New Democrats, even as a hardy band of 10 out of 106. Even as a hardy band of 10, because in fact, if, if you look, it's only been New Democrats who raise some of these issues, who give them the public profile that we need. And then if you do the sort of uh, uh, opinion testing of people, people will say, well, that's, that's what I believe in. That's what I want to see. 
Now, they may not always vote for it in elections because elections often become an exercise in mass media who can afford the most advertising. But if you actually do the opinion testing, what do people believe? What do they value? What do they think is most important? Many of these issues that only New Democrats fight for and only New Democrats are consistent on are the issues that people really do care about. Howard, what do you think of what's going on in Ottawa these days? Uh, this is the reality of minority government in a British parliamentary system. And, and, and that's what people, I think, need to recognize. And, and uh, the Harper government will do everything they can to avoid falling, to avoid uh, facing a non-confidence motion until they uh, hope they can maybe win over some liberals to join the Conservative caucus or persuade some liberals to suddenly catch the flu. You support uh, the coalition? Look, here's the, here's the economic reality. We are in deep, deep economic trouble. Many Western leaders are no longer talking about the possibility of recession. They're talking about the possibility of a depression. Governments have to get active. They have to come forward with strategies to sustain jobs and strategies to, to help uh, maintain some, some economic order. So if the Tories don't in the way you want them to, do you then support the coalition? Absolutely. You do support it? Absolutely. Do you think there's anything inconsistent uh, with the social democratic cause for New Democrats to be sitting in what is essentially a liberal-dominated cabinet and government. Forget about the faces. Uh, the issue is, what's the agenda? Uh, and uh, I, I think Jack Layton has done a marvelous job, and I think uh, uh, others have done a marvelous job in saying to the Liberals, look, we're, we're prepared uh, to, you know, to work uh, in a coalition government if you support this agenda. Uh, and that's been no small feat. Uh, now, will the Liberals uh, continue to hold to that position? God, God never knows with Liberals. I want to uh, finally get your views on the state of the world today. And by that, I mean, for 20 years as an elected official, you have been trying to convince Ontarians to consider a more social democratic sure. slash progressive agenda for this province and, in fact, for beyond. Just as you are leaving the leadership of your party, this seems to be coming true. What do you make of it? Well, it, it, it is more possible. Um, what do I make of it? I've, I think the warning signs about unregulated capitalism have been there for some time. This is not the first financial crisis that we've seen in the United States. I mean, go back and look at uh, uh, the whole dot-com thing, where a lot of econom mm -hmm. economists were saying, look, this is absurd, what's going on here? Then you look at the, the whole Enron episode, which was financial fraud on the one hand and, and uh, f obsession and fascination with markets that, <laughs> that didn't work on another. Then you look at the WorldCom, uh, the whole mm -hmm. WorldCom fraud. So a lot of things were happening in that, uh, repeatedly in the, in the financial sector. You look at some of the other international financial crises that were happening. Go back and look at Russia. Go back and look at some of the things that were happening in Asia, Argentina. Um, this is not a singular event. Over the last 10 years, there have been several warnings that sort of unregulated, the excesses of unregulated financial capitalism are getting us into trouble. Uh, and I, I think you know, some of this is just uh, compounded and, and, and finally uh, really messed things up. Do you feel vindicated? I don't think vindicated is the right word. I mean, I, I, I think we've had these lessons several times before in history. And tended to ignore them? And tended to ignore them. I mean. You know, the world was obsessed with unregulated capitalism immediately before the First World War. <laughs> Didn't work very well. Mm -hmm. The world was obsessed with financial unregulated capitalism in the late 20s, early 30s. And, and we lived through the Great Depression, a you know, singular event in my father's life, and then the Second World War following that. Um, and it, it seems that uh, you know, we don't learn uh, very well when you talk about intergenerational experience. Yeah, but you've got to suspect that... Uh... I, listen, I don't know, but I suspect that you've got to balance that with how we feel about our governments today versus how we felt about them 50 years ago. We were more trusting back then. Sure. We have been lately, uh, although not in the last couple of months, but w really concerned about giving governments too much power as a stakeholder in our society. Uh, apparently now, that's not the case. We want government to come in and help bail out the situation. As people wanted governments to bail out the situation in the, in the 30s and following yeah. the Great Depression. Um, and, and we seem to go through this ebb and flow. I mean, governments were very active in the economy immediately following the Second World War. Uh, it didn't matter where you were. If you were in the United States, if you were in Britain, if you were in Canada, 
governments were determined not to let uh, the same thing happen again. And so governments became active in, was, it didn't matter if it was health care or pensions or unemployment insurance or housing or education or the building of infrastructure. For about the last 30 years, we've heard, get government out of these things. Right. And, and social democrats like me, even in Canada, have been very much on the defensive, saying, no, don't privatize your health care system. No, don't turn your education system over to private, profit-driven institutions. Don't, uh, don't invite Bay Street into the running of your hospitals. Yeah, but even you wouldn't have anticipated the American government buying an ownership stake in some of the biggest banks in that country. They had to. They had no choice. You wouldn't have anticipated it, though, right? No, I, no, or even recommended it maybe 10 no, years I, ago. No, I, I mean, the, the reality of, of, of the United States, okay, is, is no one would have expected Roosevelt to be able to do what he did with the New Deal. I mean, he was really running against the political culture of the United States, but it seems like when the Americans get in trouble, they become very practical. <laughs> and even George Bush throws out the Milton Friedman Bible and says, you know, John Maynard Keynes, here I am. <laughs> Final question. Do you feel some sadness that after years of advocating these kinds of progressive policies, you are leaving as the leader just when the pendulum appears to be swinging back to a place where there's a bigger role for government and society and even George W. Bush knows it? Uh, not at all. And I'm not, I'm not saying I'm, I'm uh, leaving the NDP or I'm leaving public life. Um, You're not going to be the leader anymore, though. Yes, I know, because I, I sat down and said to myself, you know, can you continue to go uh, seven days and seven nights a week, 16, 17 hour days, nonstop for four years? And the honest answer is no, I can't. I can't and I don't want to. I've got other things in my life I'd rather do and that I want to pour myself into. Can you live in Toronto and be a good MPP for Kenora Rainy River, which is in a different time zone? Uh, no, not, not in the longer term you can't. And, and that, that's something I've always uh, done almost with religious fervor. Three weekends out of four, I go home, uh, and I spend uh, literally the whole weekend working in the constituency. I don't spend my summers in Toronto, heaven forbid. I mean, why would you want to spend your summer here when you <laughs> could spend it someplace as beautiful as uh, northwestern Ontario? Agreed. And, and I will continue to do that. I, I've, I've never considered myself a resident of Toronto. This is where I have to come to work, but I don't live here. I live, and I always will live there. Gotcha. Howard Hampton, thanks so much for coming into TVO tonight and visiting us. We appreciate your time. Thank you.